Today I'm going to tell you uh, about neutrinos and dark matter and specifically at, uh, for, um, about experiments that are going on at the South Pole. Um, so as uh, Kurt mentioned, I'm a, I am an assistant professor. Is it going? Okay. So I'm an assistant professor at uh, here, Yale University, uh, and I study neutri neutrinos and dark matter. I do experiments to study neutri neutrinos and dark matter. So why should we care about neutri neutrinos and dark matter? Well, um, they c constitute a huge fraction of the universe, um, and they play a very important role in, in how the universe uh, became, came to be and also how it's evolving over time. Um, <clears throat> And by understanding better how they interact with each other and with ordinary matter, um, we can understand better how the universe uh, works. Um, so um, I first became interested in uh, this subject about 10 years ago. Um, so uh, that was about the time when I earned my PhD. And I actually got my PhD uh, doing atomic physics, uh, what's traditionally known as atomic physics. So what I was doing was uh, I was using lasers to manipulate atoms. I was using lasers to push atoms around. And then I would collect them in a little little ball. Um, and then once uh, they were trapped in this, in this ball, so I can use lasers to slow down the atoms, and I could use the lasers to, to collect these atoms. And once they were collected, um, they would stay there for a long time, a lot longer than, you know, typically atoms are whooshing around all around, you know, in this room um, <clears throat> and everywhere. Um, but once you collect them, uh, you can do very uh, precise measurements on these uh, atoms. And so that's what I, that's what I was trying to do uh, uh, for, my, for my PhD. Uh, that's what I did for my PhD. Um, so, and then uh, I finished my PhD and I was uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my, my life after that. Um, and then an opportunity came up where I could use the same technique of laser cooling and trapping uh, and apply it to study uh, properties of uh, neutrinos and how neutrinos interact with uh, ordinary uh, matter. Okay, so, so that was, uh, that opportunity uh, was in uh, Berkeley, California. Uh, so I went there uh, to do what's, called, what's known as a postdoc job. So uh, when you're uh, when you finish your post, um, finish your PhD as a, as a graduate student, uh, you might get further training um, as a scientist, uh, kind of like an internship if you're going to medical school, and that's called uh, that's called postdoc in academic uh, academic world. Uh, so I did postdoc in uh, Berkeley studying uh, neutrinos, um, and then um, after that, um, okay, so neutrinos. Um, are um, uh, everywhere, um, and they're actually produced uh, often in um, uh, uh, produced when radioactive atoms like uranium, uh, thorium, or even potassium that's in your in your body uh, they can d uh, undergo radioactive decay. Okay, so the nucleus breaks apart, and when this happens, uh, neutrinos come come shooting out as well. Okay, so it also, they, they also come out from the sun. Um, so the sun is powered by uh, protons uh, fusing together to, to form helium, and then helium atoms fuse together to become boron, and then nitrogen, oxygen, uh, I forgot carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and, and so on. And so in all of these processes, neutrinos are, are being produced. Um, and so, you know, it plays a huge role in, in um, how, 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 you know, how stars um, burn. Okay, so, so I wanted to study neutrinos using laser trapping techniques. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what I did for my uh, postdoc uh, work. Um, now, um, you know, you, you may have heard that neutrinos are... Um, Interact, they interact only rarely with ordinary matter and that they're very difficult to, to detect. Um, so what we do is to, to rather to, than to, to catch them directly, uh, what we do is to study uh, how they interact with, with the environment. So uh, they might um, glance at a regular uh, nucleus and then the nucleus gets a little kick. Um, and then we can try to see how, you know, how much kick the nucleus got. 
or you might glance off of electrons, and then we know how to, how to look at that as well. So that's how we uh, uh, look at um, neutrinos that are uh, ordinary, you, you know, di very difficult to detect, uh, but by using their interaction with ordinary matter, we can study the properties of neutrinos. <coughs> Okay, so uh, with the laser trapping and uh, cooling and trapping, I was looking at this byproduct of, of nuclear decay. Um, so the, the, the experiments that I want to tell you today uh, are called ice cube and DM ice. So DM ice is an offshoot of um, ice cube. Um, so these uh, experiments uh, also study neutrinos uh, and dark matter, um, and I'll tell you about that. And both of these are located at the South Pole. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, okay, so Ice Cube is, uh, we call it a neutrino telescope. So not only do we study the properties uh, of the neutrinos themselves, um, because these um, uh, particles are produced in the inner uh, workings of the sun, I, I, or, or you know, stars. Uh, also, when um, when uh, stars collapse into supernovae, uh, active galactic nuclei, these processes we think uh, should also be producing uh, neutrinos. And so, Ice, Ice Cube's goal is to try to detect these neutrinos coming from this very uh, energetic uh, processes that are going on uh, in in the universe. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I got involved in ice cube when I uh, moved, uh, as Kurt said, with my husband uh, to, to Wisconsin. So that was in 2006. Um, and uh, um, I worked on ice cube. Uh, and in the meantime, I also uh, started a new project called uh, DM ICE. Uh, to, to try to look for dark matter uh, at the South Pole. Um, and so somewhere along the, the, the way, um, I became a professor, so that was about in 2010. And then uh, last summer, uh, uh, we moved, our family uh, moved to, uh, to Connecticut, to New Haven, um, here to Yale University. Um, so I'm continuing uh, this research on neutrinos and dark matter. Um, and. Uh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing more of you um, in, in, you know, as, as we uh, build more at Yale. Um, so I mentioned that, that we just moved to Connecticut, um, but actually I'm not new to Connecticut. I, I grew up in Connecticut, um, so I went to middle school and, and high school, uh, and so I'm, I'm uh, really happy to be back here. Uh, and I, I've missed it for the last uh, 20 years, uh, but I'm very glad to be back. Okay, um, so uh, let's, uh, let's get on to physics, enough about me. Um, so, okay, so you see uh, my slides here. <coughs> so this is a picture um, of the South Pole, and in particular, um, uh, this is uh, uh, the Ice Cube uh, lab. So uh, the bulk of the detector for Ice Cube is actually buried two and a half kilometers, so over a mile under the ice that you see here. And what, all you can see are um, the, the cables that come up. Uh, you don't even see the cables, but they're going up through into those uh, uh, towers across uh, the, the channel and into the, into the uh, laboratory there. And the, the laboratory is full of computers where we process the data coming uh, from all the optical sensors that are underneath the ice. Um, and then uh, the, once the data gets processed, um, they, um, they get put on uh, satellite. Uh, the data comes over satellite uh, and to, to Northern America, uh, North America. Okay, so the, the, the question uh, that we, uh, we try to answer, uh, that we're trying to address in uh, physics, um, is, um, is uh, essentially uh, what is matter? Uh, so what are, we, what are we made of? And what are the, the rules or the laws that govern how this matter uh, behaves? Okay, so, um, so you know, uh, what we like to do to study uh, these, uh, what we're made of and um, how, how, uh, what the rules are, um, uh, what we like to do is to, we, we like to break up um, you know, we made up into little smaller and smaller chunks, uh, and then um, we, we uh, study how they, they behave. So um, I found actually on this, on, this on, the, on the web, so I'm just going to 
uh, show it to you. So it's called, um, let's see if I can uh, get it to the center. It's called the scale of the universe. Okay, so uh, here we are on the human scale and the unit of length that we like to use in physics, uh, and this is an international unit, it's called a uh, meter. One meter is about this long, okay? A yard or three feet, about that. Um, so I'm about 1.5 meters tall. Um, you know, that's a slightly taller uh, gentleman there. Um, okay, so we're gonna go zoom in uh, to, uh, to see um, uh, what happens when we go uh, into that. Okay, so I don't know who Russell is, but whoever made this animation, I presumably he's using teapot. Shrew, you zoom in longer, you got a quail. Ant, right, smaller, smaller. Now you're talking about a millimeter. Um, so that's about the size of, say, a pixel on your computer screen. Might, amoeba. Okay, so we're gonna go even smaller. Uh, so here's a human egg, uh, smallest thing visible to the naked eye. So that's about as small as your eyes can see. Um, and then let's uh, keep zooming in. So here's a mist droplet, um, nucleus of a cell. Okay, so now we're starting to break apart uh, the, the ordinary things that we can see every day. Okay, so you go zoom in, zoom in chromosome, right? And now you're a, a micron, okay, micrometer, 10 to the minus six meters. So now you're talking about viruses. Okay, let's keep going. You zoom in more and more DNA. Okay, let's zoom in more. And here's, here's nanometer, 10 to the minus nine uh, meters. Okay, so this, uh, you're talking about uh, fairly large atoms. So atom is made of uh, nucleus and a cloud of electrons around it. Okay, um, so let's zoom in further. So you got water molecule, carbon atoms, angstrom, tenth of a nanometer. Uh, so at angstrom, you're talking about hydrogen atoms, helium atoms. So these are some of the smallest atoms, uh, or these are the smallest atoms that are around. Okay, so let's go break things up either, even further. Okay, so now you have picometer, 10 to the minus 12 meter. Okay, let's keep going. So now, we get to the nucleus, okay? So we've stripped away the electron cloud, um, and at this scale, we're starting to see things like uh, big nuclei like uh, uranium, um, here's chlorine, let's keep going, helium nucleus, proton, protons and neutrons. So these are on the scale of 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay, so this is starting to get to the level uh, where, we, uh, where we call uh, particle physics and fundamental physics, nuclear physics is at this scale. Um, where we've uh, taken atoms apart and you're left with protons and neutrons. Um, and uh, you know, for a long time, uh, we thought this was as small as we could go. So uh, uh, Marie Curie, right, uh, look, looked at um, uranium nucleus um, and she was studying how these nuclei uh, break apart. Okay, so you could, she knew that these things can um, break apart. And then you go toward uh, protons um, and, and neutrons, let's zoom in more. So you can go even more. And then now we know that the protons and uh, neutrons can break up even further into what we call quarks. So we've never been able to observe these by themselves, uh, so, but collectively uh, we can break up um, protons and uh, neutrons. Uh, and we can see evidence of, of these, uh, these par uh, part particles, quarks. Okay, and we can actually go even uh, further, okay? So strange quark, uh, other t different types of quarks. Um, and now we're getting into the neutrino regime, 10 to the minus 21. So if you ever wanted to know what the prefix is for 10 to the minus 21, it's zetometer, zeptometer. Never used it. Okay, here's more quarks. Let's keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. Okay, so there's really not much uh, in this uh, region. Uh, and let's just go all the way in. Um, and then this is the smallest scale uh, that we ever think about uh, is the Planck length. And so if you ever heard about string theory and so on, this is the, the length scale 
that we're talking about. So, and then in the corner, you see 10 to the minus 35 meters. Okay. So now we study this, this, uh, this very uh, small scale. Uh, let's see what happens if we go all the way out to the, to the, to the big scale. All right. So I'm going to go back out to the human scale. <laughs> okay. And you can, you can go and look this up online. It comes with a really, um, really cool music, and so I'm not playing that. But um, OK, so human scale is coming up. OK, so, okay, so let's go zoom out. So sunflowers, a little bit bigger than human beings. Uh, elephants, dinosaurs, trees, bigger dinosaurs, bigger trees, airplanes. Okay, um, bigger structures that humans have built. Um, Eiffel Tower, the, the pyramids, um, Hoover Dam, right? And then other uh, structures. So this is on the order of a kilometer, 10 to the three meters. A kilometer is uh, two thirds of a, of a mile. Okay, so you've got Hoover Dam, uh, Half Dome. Uh, let's keep zooming out. Um, so, <clears throat> Central Park, okay, and big comets, uh, or small comets, I should say, Mount Everest, um, <laughs> distance of a marathon, if any of you are, are marathon runners. Um, you, can, you can go clear across Rhode Island if you do that. All right, so let's keep zooming out. So, countries uh, and uh, moons, moons of um, planets. Okay, so this is the scale when 400 years ago, when Galileo first started uh, using telescopes to look up into the sky, right? So he could see some of these moons. Um, he could see uh, some details of the planets. <laughs> it might be bigger by now, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, People are laughing about the Minecraft. Okay, so um, okay, the sun, okay, and bigger planetary objects. So you've got uh, the Polaris, and here's the scale uh, distance uh, from Earth to Sun. Okay, so let's keep looking out further. Okay, so. And here's uh, what uh, uh, the, the distance, so the light day is the distance uh, light can travel uh, in one day. So you can see it's, it's quite a bit of distance that light can travel, uh, but it, it does take one day for light to cover this distance. And um, that's uh, comparable to uh, some of the lo longest distances that humans have ever covered. So uh, Voyager 1 uh, was a satellite that was sent out to the universe, and that's, that took, I think, 10, 20 years or something to, to get out there. Okay. All right, so uh, let's keep going out. All right, so some of the bigger objects out in the sky that we can see, so uh, nebula, nebulae, nebul, nebulae, okay, um, and uh, bigger objects, nebulae, um, and then now you're starting to get into clusters uh, of, of these things. So here's the dwarf galaxy, the Magellanic Cloud. Um, so that these are some of the objects that are closest uh, to, the, to our galaxy, um, but a little bit outside. Okay, so, and here's, uh, let's see. Okay, so let's see. So here are some of the galaxies that you see, um, and you just keep zooming out. Okay, so here's the local group, right? So uh, galactic center plus the large Magellanic cloud and so so on is called the the, the local group. Um, some of our neighbors, Virgo cluster, um, and then now we're at Yoda meter, Yoda meter, okay, ten to the twenty-four meters. Okay, so we can zoom out even more. And you keep going, and um, here's uh, some of that Sloan Digital uh, um, uh, Survey, uh, Sky Survey um, has seen, you know, can see all out to to these uh, distances, giga, gigaparsecs. 
okay? And then uh, Hubble telescope can see uh, out to, to that distance there, okay? Um, and then you get to the edge of the observable universe. Okay, so I've taken you from the smallest things that we ever think about to the biggest thing that we uh, ever talk about. And by studying the smallest things that we can ever think about, we can uh, track the history of what is going on in the biggest scale of the universe. Pretty cool, right? All right, so let's go back to the to the slideshow. Okay, so um, so what, now that we've broken up um, what we uh, think about uh, to to the smallest things that we can uh, think about. Um, we've uh, identified four different forces that rule all of this uh, matter. So uh, gravity, uh, so we all know that. If I jump, I'm gonna come back down uh, to, to, to the ground. Um, second one is the electromagnetic force. So especially in the winter, um, you notice this a lot, right? So you shuffle your he feet around on carpet, you touch the light, you get a nice zap. All of this, right? We know how to control uh, electromagnetic force uh, the, the best. Um, so, you know, all the lights we see in here, uh, electricity, um, all the, um, all the right, electronics, um, computers, all of this is using the electromagnetic force. There are two that you may not have uh, heard about very much, and those uh, govern how the nuclei are put together. So the strong force uh, binds uh, the neutrons and the protons together inside the nucleus. Um, and then the weak force is, is the force that helps it uh, break apart, and that's the force uh, that um, neutrinos uh, can interact with ordinary matter with. Uh, and um, dark matter, we think, uh, should be able to interact with ordinary matter using, using the weak force. Okay, so we, uh, I think about the, the weak force a lot. And then we try to simplify this even more. So uh, it's been successful, uh, we've su successfully combined um, the uh, electromagnetic and the, the, the weak force, uh, and we can pretty much do that with the strong force, uh, but nobody's uh, ever been able to um, to do that uh, with with gravity. Okay, so gravity's uh, sticking out on its own, and we don't really know how to reconcile how to think of it as one one rule uh, of all these uh, four forces. Uh, but this is uh, something that a lot of people are trying to do. Okay, so we're going to focus on uh, gravity uh, and the weak force, uh, and then our detectors use uh, electromagnetic force quite a bit. Okay, so, um, so I gave you a picture of these different particles that we think about and then the four different uh, particles, um, but of course there are a lot of mysteries out there that we don't understand. So one of them uh, are the cosmic rays. So in 1912, uh, Victor Hess um, uh, realized, and so here's uh, Victor Hess uh, boarding uh, a, a, a balloon. So what he saw were these particles, um, these, um, um, these events uh, in his detector, and he was curious as to what, where they were coming from. So there were these particles that he could see, and he thought they were coming up from the Earth. Um, but um, to, to prove uh, that it is really actually coming up from the Earth, what he did was to, he, to put the detector on a balloon, right? and he flew up high, and, and if it really is coming from uh, from the Earth, then the number of these particles should, uh, should decrease as he goes up. So what he found was that as he went up, uh, these, uh, the number of par these particles increased, um, and uh, uh, the field of cosmic ray uh, physics was born. And so what we see uh, is that um, as you look up into the sky, there are these uh, charged particles that are flying around everywhere. Uh, and then this is a, a plot this is how you just read this plot. So this is a, the energy of these particles versus the number of these particles going through a particular uh, area. Um, and then so there are lots of them at lower energies. As you uh, look at higher energies, uh, there are many of them. Um, and then so there are these, these charged particles 
And for a long time, people didn't really understand uh, where they were coming from. And so uh, there have been many, many studies to, to look for these. Uh, and the modern day uh, ones, uh, detectors are uh, installed up in a satellite, or we also uh, can do ground-based uh, uh, detectors where we look up into the sky, look for these cosmic rays uh, coming into the atmosphere, they decay, uh, and then we try to, uh, to reconstruct what it was that they came from. So it looks like these uh, particles are mostly coming from uh, things like supernovae. Um, so these, uh, pr uh, these uh, supernovae or uh, these um, um, things can accelerate uh, charged particles, uh, and this is what we see. And so one of Ice, Cube, uh, Ice Cube's mission is to try to uh, complete the picture of how cosmic rays are produced so that the, um, the processes that produce these charged particles should also uh, produce uh, neutrinos. And so Ice Cube wants to see uh, uh, these, these neutrinos that are produced uh, in the same way as, as comet cosmic rays. Okay, and then dark matter. Okay, so um, in 1933, uh, Franz uh, Fritz Zwicky, uh, he was looking up at, um, through telescope, and what he noticed uh, was uh, that um, the mass of the galaxies within what's called the coma cluster uh, uh, seemed to be, there didn't seem to be enough mass to, to, um, to look at the, to, to produce the motion that, um, that, they were, uh, that they were moving at. So I brought a little demo of mine. So here's an apple. You can't talk about gravity without apples, right? Um, so what he was noticing was that um, uh, as, um, so the way the, the planets move is, is with gravity. And I can't really uh, produce gravity for you, so I'm just going to use uh, this. And so uh, think of my hand as, say, a big sun, and then here's a planet, uh, and then I'm going to swing this around, okay? So this is how you produce circular motion. And as I swing this, I can feel, right, pull on my hand uh, produced by uh, the planet, the little planet that I'm swinging, all right? So I can do this at a constant speed, but if I swing faster, I have to hold on to this bag harder, otherwise one of you is going to get clunked by an apple in the head. All right, so this is, this is what he found, is that, um, that the um, velocity of the, uh, the objects that he sees up in the sky is moving a lot faster than if uh, the sun, or you know, what was in the middle of this uh, cent uh, circular motion, uh, it, just, it just seemed to be a lot massive. So bigger objects exert bigger gravity, um, and there just, there just seemed to be a lot more uh, mass out there. Okay, so this study continued into the, into the 70s. Um, so uh, Vera Rubin and uh, co-workers found uh, that rotation of uh, galaxies uh, are, are flat. So uh, you have galaxies and it's rotating around the uh, center and it's, that, it's not this two point, um, you know, um, uh, so it's not just two bodies that we're talking about, uh, but all the, all the mass that's between, you know, my hand and, and out, outer perimeter. And she, f she also found uh, that there seemed to be a lot more mass in between uh, than what you could see uh, with optical telescopes. And so she said, what you see in a spiral galaxy is not what you get. Okay, so since then there have been more evidence for dark matter. Um, so one of the coolest things you can do is uh, be, um, you can actually bend light using uh, gravity. So you may have heard about how light behaves uh, like um, like particle, um, and uh, if you put a massive object in between uh, you and whatever it is that you're trying to see or distance a star, and if there's a mass uh, in front of it. Uh, you can actually see the light bending. So you can see um, in this uh, picture, uh, in uh, black and white, uh, is that if, if um, you can see uh, some of this streaking right, features, and so this is due to um, um, light being bent around uh, massive 
uh, object that exerts gravity, uh, but we can't actually see using these uh, telescopes. And then the bullet cluster is, is kind of an interesting uh, example. And so this is a, a false color rendering um, of uh, where we think the dark matter is, that's in blue, and where we think the hot gas uh, out there, uh, so that's in pink. So there are these two uh, clumps of, of uh, matter passing by each other. Okay. And then uh, the dark matter, uh, uh, the rendering is essentially done by things like gravitational lensing. So we try to see where the dark matter is. And then these two objects collided with each other. And because dark matter doesn't interact very much with each other, they just kind of went straight past each other. Uh, but the hot gas uh, that is in this uh, in these two uh, clouds, uh, actually got you know they interacted with each other and they they were uh, they were getting dragged uh, and slowed uh, slowed down by each other, and so this is the um, this is another example of um, how why we think there's uh, dark matter out there. Okay, um, so. Um, this is uh, the picture that we have when we uh, have um, compiled all of the information that we have from uh, optical telescope and mostly, uh, actually all from uh, gravity, right? We can see dark matter with, with gravity. And then uh, by simulation, um, we, can, uh, we think the dark matter is distributed more or less evenly, uh, but there's these you know, uh, filaments, uh, and little clumps and so on, but the clumps, you know, everywhere you look, it kind of looks like this. And then uh, there are these uh, uh, images that we can take. Um, and then um, if you've heard about cosmic microwave background, uh, again, uh, the, um, the dark matter can distort how, how the uh, microwave gets to us from the furthest uh, reach of the, the sky. Um, and so from that, we can see dark matter uh, and then uh, if we go, if we zoom in, <laughs> zoom in to, to look at the galaxy, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. And so here's our Mil Milky Way, and then there's this halo of dark matter that surrounds it. Okay, so that's the picture of, of uh, dark matter that we have uh, today. Now I want to tell you a little bit about neutrinos. Okay, so neutrinos... Um, they're pretty much uh, everywhere, and they were produ produced in the Big Bang. So when, when the universe uh, first started, uh, there were these neutrinos. And then uh, these neutrinos, there were about 300, 330 neutrinos per square, square centimeter. Square centimeter is like you know, the tip of my pinky. <clears throat> and then there were only 0.5 protons in that volume. Okay. Um, so uh, when we look out, um, there are different uh, neutrinos coming from all sorts of sources. So supernovae um, produce uh, neutrinos. Um, there are high energy uh, cosmic uh, neutrinos uh, that we would like to see. Um, so that's, that's, you know, that's the story of Ice Cube. Um, the sun produces neutrinos. Um, and then when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, um, the Earth's atmosphere, uh, they can break up into smaller uh, chunks, and uh, that process also produces neutrinos. And then uh, the Earth itself uh, ne uh, produces neutrinos, so uh, uh, the Earth is warm, uh, the core of the Earth is warm, and that's powered uh, by radioactive decay of things like uranium right, and thorium. And so those, uh, those radioactive decays producing neutrinos. And then there are uh, also man-made neutrinos. So uh, particle accelerators can make them, uh, and uh, power uh, nuclear reactors also make neutrinos. OK. So uh, in, in all, there are some 30 trillion neutrinos go through your body every second. Okay? And these are mostly the cosmic uh, neutrinos. Right? 30 trillion neutrinos, uh, but most just go right through. We don't ever feel them. Okay. All right, so this is uh, the picture of the neutrinos we had in uh, the late 90s, okay, until 1998. So we thought there were three uh, different kinds of neutrinos, um, and this is similar to the, the quarks uh, that we talked about in the beginning. 
And so there are the, um, the electrons, uh, muons, and tau neutrinos, and that's associated with electrons, muons, and tau. And so those, those are also elementary particles. And, we thought, so, and then there were three flowers, flavors, and then we, we, um, we only had some limit of, some idea of how big, how small, mm, how, so we, we had an idea of that they might have some mass, um, but mostly uh, the description of the universe consisted of a massless uh, neutrino. Okay. So what happened in 1998 um, is that, uh, uh, and uh, through, say, 2003, were these um, series of experiments called uh, Super Cameo Kande, um, and then accelerator-based uh, uh, ex um, experiments, also in Japan. Uh, snow, uh, this is up in Canada, and Camland. Um, so these experiments um, uh, found that actually uh, neutrinos indeed have mass, um, and that actually has some implication as to, um, to right, how that universe is, is, is made up. So just to give you a scale of uh, these experiments, uh, so here's a boat with, th a little boat with three people. So it's a detector that is filled with water, a, a tank, cylindrical tank filled with water. And then uh, these three people are, are uh, inspecting uh, the light sensors uh, that will detect the neutrinos once uh, this detector is running. Uh, snow is about eight meters in diameter, so it's, uh, I think, as big as this, this room. Okay, so these are big detectors uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, um, detect these very weakly interacting particles. Okay, so these are, uh, so we talked about uh, ordinary matter, we talked about uh, dark matter, um, and then th there was even yet another surprise uh, in this uh, time around 1998 um, and also in 2003. And this is what we found. So by looking, so supernovas are actually pretty useful instruments. They, they, this is, you know, supernovas uh, are formed by stars uh, collapsing uh, on their own, uh, and it, it, they produce a lot of light. Okay, so here's a picture of one of these observations from, I think, uh, from the Hubble telescope. Um, so here's a supernova going off. You see that little dot? And there's actually as much light coming out of that little dot as an entire galaxy that is nearby. Okay, so it produces a lot of light, and it produces a lot of light that is about the same every time. Okay, so it's a good, good um, calibration source. It's a good uh, light source where we can say, okay, um, if we see uh, this light at some distance, I, I should see so much, uh, so much light coming from the supernovae. If it's further, I should see less amount of light. So it tells us the distance um, of, of, of uh, uh, these objects. The brightness tells us the, uh, the objects. Um, and then uh, uh, from, um, uh, oops, sorry, uh, cosmic uh, microwave background, uh, we saw actually um, that uh, the furthest edges of the universe that we can see uh, is actually uh, accelerating. So, the picture that we have of the universe uh, evolving is that it started out with a, uh, with a big bang, and then uh, the universe expan expanded. Okay, so it was in the beginning, it was uh, slowly expanding, uh, and then at some point, it started, it start, the expansion started accelerating. So what, is that, what does that mean? So I'm gonna take out my trusted apple again, right? So in, in normal circumstances, if I throw up this up into the air, what would happen? Right, so it would go up. Let's see if I can do this without dropping it. Right, it would go up and it comes back down. What these experiments were observing was that if, you, if I were to throw up this uh, apple in the air, it would actually start accelerating. So it would speed up and keep going. Okay, so that just seems weird, right? So this is uh, now what we call dark energy. Whatever energy, whatever force it is that's making this apple fly away from where we are. Okay. So we don't have a very good idea, really, of, of uh, what dark energy is. We've, we've given it name, right? And we can see the effect it has on, on the expansion of the universe. 
uh, but there's a lot of experiments that are trying to, to figure out what this is. Okay, so that's dark energy. So you put all of this together, and this is the picture of the universe that we have. Okay, so if you've heard of E is equal to mc squared, uh, we, we think of matter and energy uh, to be, uh, um, you know, of, of one and the same. Um, and so if you break up um, what is in the universe, um, the heavy elements like uh, iron and so on makes up only 0.03% of the universe. Right? And then neutrinos, which we thought were so abundant, is only 0.3% of the total energy of the universe. Let's go a little, little bigger. Stars, 0.5%. Okay, so stars, there's as much stars nearly, you know, and as, as neutrinos nearly. Isn't that amazing? So there's just neutrinos streaming through. Bulk of what we know that's out there is actually hydrogen and helium. That only makes up 4% of the total energy density of the universe. The rest is this dark matter, right, stuff that is making, my, making the planets go faster than what we, how, than we think they should, and dark energy. Okay, so there's so much of the universe that we really don't know how to, to think about. Okay, so uh, we've been talking about how uh, difficult it is to detect neutrinos and dark matter. Well, um, they, play, um, they do play a major role, um, and you know, the upside is that there's a lot of them. Right. So even though they interact very little, there's a lot of them. The catch is that they interact so little with our nerve. It's, it's, it's actually really difficult to detect. So uh, here's kind of a cartoon picture to show you exactly how, uh, how elusive they are. Um, they can go through a light year, okay? the distance that light can travel in one year. So that's, that's much further than you know, to the sun. So that, that it can go through a light year of lead without ever interacting uh, with, with, with lead. Right. All right, so uh, to, to detect neutrinos, we want to build big and quiet. So you know, if you want to hear something very uh, faint, right, you want, you want every noise to be, quiet, to, to be gone. So same thing with detectors. You want every other uh, noise event to be gone. So, and then you want to build it big so that you have a chance of catching them. Okay, so where can we, um, so I'm gonna skip this slide a little bit. So if we look at the, the, um, the close uh, by um, our galaxy, um, and uh, then uh, I described that we think there's this halo of dark matter, Okay, so how do we detect uh, dark matter? Uh, so the way we do it is um, there's this halo of dark matter, um, and then the sun is rotating around the center of the galaxy. And the sun is rotating around the center of the gal galaxy at 200 kilometers per second. That's 450,000 miles per hour. Imagine that. Okay, And then the Earth is going along for a ride, and it's actually rotating around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. Okay, so, and then it also rotates once a day, right? And if you're sitting at the equator, you're on top of that, you're rotating at 1,000 miles per hour. Okay. Great roller coaster, right? Merry-go-round. Okay, so the way we look for dark matter is we can look for these occasional cases where it just, you know, kicks, uh, knocks the nuclei or whatever we know, um, you know, how to detect. Uh, we can also look for this annual modulation. So part of the year we should see more interaction, part of the year we should see less. And then we can also look for uh, daily modulation in that signal. Okay, so there are uh, several uh, ideas of what this dark matter could be. Uh, and then we call these um, weakly interacting massive particles. So this weakly is that weak interaction force that we talked about. Okay. And then we know they have mass, okay. and, and we know, we, we think they could be particles. So this is pretty much all we know about dark matter that we see out there. Okay, so how are we going to look for this? Um, so I want to show you, uh, now that we talked about these particles that we're trying to detect, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, ice cube and, and, and uh, DMIs. 
Okay, so this is what South Pole looks like when you get to uh, when you fly in. So to get to the South Pole, this this is what you do. You you fly on a commercial airplane to um, Christchurch, New Zealand, and there you get outfitted with you know your your red parkas that you might have seen, um, or you know, and just uh, warm warm clothes uh, so that you don't freeze when you get there. Um, and then you f uh, fly on a military airplane uh, to McMurdo, so the edge of um, sorry, it's hard to edge of Antarctica. Um, and then you fly, you take another flight uh, to get to the South Pole. And then when you fly into that South Pole, um, you fly uh, to this runway, um, and then uh, you see the uh, thank you, you see the uh, South Pole station. Okay, South Pole Station here, uh, and this is the footprint of the ice cube. So it's a kilometer wide, two and a half kilometers deep into the into the ice. Okay, so uh, I want to have a little time to to show you uh, what the detectors looks like, and and also some pictures from the South Pole. So I'm going to skip a few slides from now. So what we do is we uh, drilled uh, holes into the ice. Uh, and then we uh, instrument every hole with 60 uh, of these optical sensors. Okay, so this, uh, this thing can actually detect light. And uh, uh, so each of these uh, is about uh, this big, okay, and 60 of these are in each of these holes. Okay, so this is how we detect neutrinos. So neutrinos come in uh, from some source, it doesn't matter, um, and then they interact with the ice, and then they get converted to, for example, muons. Okay. So once they have been converted into muons, these are regular charged particles, and we know how to detect them. And actually, when charged particles go through medium, not, that's not vacuum, uh, they can travel faster than light. Okay. And they, uh, so that's nothing special, they can travel faster. So when they do that, um, they produce this shock wave, and we call this Cherenkov light. Okay, so this shock wave, it's like sonic boom. When, when airplanes go faster than speed of sound, you get this boom. Okay, so uh, we, we look, at, look for this boom of light, uh, and then these optical sensors can see uh, where they were. And then by uh, picking out which, uh, which light sensor saw light, we can point back to where this neutrinos, uh, neutrino mass stuff come from. Okay, so it's a pretty big collaboration. It's about 300 uh, physicists from all over the world. Okay, so many are in the U.S. Uh, a lot, many are in Sweden, in um, and in Germany. There's one institution in um, in Japan, uh, and few in um, uh, Australia and New Zealand. All right, so this is what our event viewer looks like. So it doesn't actually look like this, um, but as particles come in, uh, this is how we uh, look at our events. So the, the color of the light tells you uh, the time uh, in the time window um, that the optical sensors saw some light. Uh, so red is early um, and blue is late. Uh, yeah, and then the size of the bubble tells you how much light it saw. Okay. So all we see essentially are these, and then from the information we get here, uh, we draw these lines uh, that point back to where these might have come from. Okay, so to drill these two and a half kilometers into the ice, this is what we do. So the first top bit of the ice is actually pretty mushy, snowy stuff. So we use uh, heater coils to go down there. Uh, and then once you break through that, we switch the type of drill, and then we use a hot water jet to go into uh, to go down to two and a half kilometers uh, into the ice. Okay. And then once that hole is uh, drilled, and the, this uh, drill is is extracted from the water, um, and then we uh, start instrumenting uh, the the, um, the ice uh, with these optical modules. So the, the, wa the holes are full of water, uh, and then we uh, dunk these uh, sensors in, and then we let the water freeze around our sensors. Um, and so once, once the light sensors are in there, we can actually 
uh, extract them again. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a team of the, the ice uh, drillers. Um, can anybody find me in this picture? <laughs> yeah, so they let, me, they let me hang out with them. And the way you can tell a physicist from a driller, I don't know, can anybody tell? Okay, my, my jacket is very clean. Okay. <laughs> so these, these uh, men and women worked so hard to drill these, these holes. Um, and then we get to come in and you know, drop in our sensors and so on. Um, but the, it's, it's really a fantastic bunch to work with. Um, and here's a picture of, of uh, scientists um, after the completion of IceCube. So IceCube actually took a long time to complete. And the time that we spent on the ice uh, is about seven years. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the South Pole is only accessible uh, for four months out of the year. And you know, every four months of those years, we were back every, every year uh, to build this. So we, we made a detector. Uh, here's, here's me again. OK. It's very exciting. OK, so this is a picture of this uh, DM ice uh, detector. All right, so I'm going to skip these uh, things. OK, so uh, because IceCube was being constructed, we also wanted to uh, attach a couple of other instruments here. Uh, and so this one uh, is, uh, is an instrument uh, that is looking for this annual modulation signature that we can expect from dark matter. So there's one experiment that claims to have seen this modulation. And a lot of people have tried to, to check their answers. Um, you know, some people say, well, I don't really believe you. Um, the, the annual, you know, there's so many things that uh, change annually, like the seasons, the temperature. You know, maybe one of these things could be affecting how your instrument works. Um, and so what we, what we are trying, what we want to do with this uh, is to check, uh, you know, their, their um, extra extraordinary claim, right? They've, they've detected dark matter. And so what we want to do is to, to repeat this experiment at the South Pole where the seasons uh, are different uh, than in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and so uh, this is a prototype that went in with IceCube uh, and we're in the process of building the, the bigger next generation uh, experiment now. Okay, so uh, it's a smaller uh, group of people. Uh, so here's some pictures of, uh, from the construction uh, of the uh, instrument. Um, so I mentioned uh, that we want to keep these detectors as quiet as possible. So we, these were built using, um, using a, a clean room-like uh, environment. <clears throat> um, and here uh, are some pictures uh, from the South Pole. Okay. So you thought you were going to the most remote place on Earth, uh, and this is <laughs> this is what you see. Uh, so to drill these these um, these holes, it actually takes quite a bit of infrastructure to do that. And I, I mentioned it's a hot water drill. You have to heat up all of all of this water. You can see all this piping <coughs> sending uh, water all around. Okay, so let's do some pictures. Okay, so. Living uh, at the South Pole has gotten, um, actually any questions on, on, uh, on the science part of it? So, so I'm gonna show a few, few pictures uh, from the South Pole, but if you have um, questions from, about the science, I can answer them. Yeah. What's the advantage of understanding the nature of the Yeah, so we see that right, they, they're, um, they're out there. Um, but we don't know how they interact with each other. We don't know how they interact with ordinary matter. Um, so we have a picture of what, it, what, what, what the universe looks like today. And we have a picture of, you know, we can go back in time by looking at distant light. Uh, we, have, we have a picture of what, how the universe evolved. But, you know, to go beyond um, how, um, how it might evolve in the future, you know, it might be useful to know what, what, what they are. It also constitutes 25% of the universe. Why wouldn't you want to know what they are? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, so you talk about dark matter. Say something about antimatter. Antimatter. 
Um, well, so um, we know what we know is that um, when we look out there, we hardly see any of it out there. So that's a whole another question, a whole another sort of physics. Um, but that's that is a, a really big question that people are trying to answer. So you know, we there's matter and antimatter. Uh, yeah, matter and antimatter, if they collide with each other, they should annihilate. You can also create ma matter and antimatter, but from pure energy, can, you, know, you can pop matter and antimatter out. So whatever Big Bang was, you know, it should have produced the same number of matter and antimatter, but what we see out there is only matter. And so there is some process that, made, that had an imbalance uh, between these uh, processes. And we don't know why that is. And that's actually one of the biggest uh, research that's going on today. Yeah. So, so in the solar system, mm -hmm. what percentage of the solar system is dark matter and dark energy? In the solar system. So I think it's, it's pretty much about that, this 25%. Right. Yeah. What phenomena, unexplained phenomena, can only be explained? You know, that's, that's nearby. If it's, if it's so perfect. Um, so um, right, so the um, so the sun is pretty close to the edge. So the effect, so the effect of the, the dark matter is more obvious as you go further out from the center of the galaxy. So if you remember the curve from Ver Rubin, uh, the difference between only having matter and dark matter is, is just a lot more pronounced further out you go. Um, and so if you go further out in the galaxy, uh, the objects that are rotating around uh, the, the center of the galaxy are moving way faster than they should. So we haven't detected anything locally? That's right. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. 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 So like the percentage of dark matter and dark energy in the Earth is uh, so, I mean, the, you know, the Earth, the, so we're essentially sw swimming in, in dark matter and we're streaming through it in the universe, yeah. Yeah. Some weak interaction can result in the imbalance of matter matter? Uh, it could, but we don't know how yet. Yeah. Yeah. How do you make neutrinos? Um, well, uh, everything that's sitting in this room, the little dust particles, has just a tiny, a part in a million, is has a little bit um, is is a uranium particle, or your body has lots of potassium in it, and a part in ten to the uh, a part, part in ten one in ten thousand is a is a radioactive isotope of potassium, and so when the, when these uh, atoms uh, decay, they actually emit neutrinos. Yeah. And they also come out from the sun, like when the protons fuse together, things like that. Yeah. Um, so in, in a medium, uh, so you, you start out with muons traveling, you know, has some ener energy, uh, and then in a medium, as, as long as they have enough energy, they, they can travel just that fast. Probably not. Yeah. So I talked about you know combining the weak and the electromagnetic force, uh, but that only occurs uh, at a very very uh, different energy than our everyday uh, energy that we talk about. Yeah. So it's mostly uh, curiosity, um, but you know they they it matters um, how how much energy is coming out of the sun, right? And it matters, uh, you know, and so there are some applications that people have come up with. It's like, like can you monitor uh, power of nuclear reactors uh, using that? But mostly it's, it's uh, curiosity. Yeah. How can dark matter be created? How can dark matter be created? That's a really good question. Um, so it was created in the Big Bang um, and uh, yeah. And we also try to create this in things like places like um, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, and so we try to create it, see if we can create it in a way that we understand. And maybe those dark matter particles that we create is, is the dark matter particles that we see out there. One final question, so Rena can finish, because I know some people have to leave for other events. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, go ahead. 
lightning storms, uh, no. Okay. All right, so these are really good questions. So, so you know, here's some pictures that I pulled together. So last year was the 100th anniversary of people getting to the South Pole ever. Um, and a lot has changed. It's gotten a lot, lot more comfortable to get there. I could actually, you know, leave uh, and come back within a few weeks, right, from home to, to home, back to home. Um, and, you know, 100 years ago, you had to take essentially two years uh, of trip to, to, to go there, and some people never some people never came back. <laughs> um, so, right, so, you know, you took a ship and you had to wait for the oceans to thaw out before you get there, and then you spend the whole winter, um, and then, you know, after the, the, the spring comes, and then you could start, you know, traversing across, um, and so now, you know, we just take an airplane to get there. Um, the reason to go to the South Pole is still science-driven. Okay, so the first, um, trips were scientific expeditions. So if you read about Shackleton um, or Amundsen, um, at least the excuse was that we we're going to do science uh, in Antarctica. And uh, at least the excuse now <laughs> is uh, still to do science. Okay? And, and it's really amazing science that, that we can do. Uh, transportation's improved quite a bit. Right? So you could take dog, dog sled, um, people sled, um, and we essentially uh, fly in there. Accommodations has, has gotten a lot also uh, uh, com more comfortable. Um, so you, know, you, you, you only took what you could carry uh, back then. Uh, and now uh, we, yeah, we, we take what we can carry, but on airplanes, right? Um, teamwork is uh, still a big part of this. I mean, it is still a very remote location. If you leave the station, you know, you, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that it is very cold outside um, and the altitude is actually quite high, so you do have to be careful about um, altitude as well. Um, so teamwork is, is an important part. You know, we go there, we're building this big experiment um, and camaraderie that comes out of, you know, getting, doing, um, making, uh, working toward one single goal, um, you know, that, that is, um, you know, I, I really enjoy uh, working uh, with this team. I would say the food has also improved uh, quite a bit. So here's a picture of the uh, cafeteria uh, that exists now. And actually uh, flying food there uh, is the most expensive part of, of food. So it, the, the cost of food is dominated by, you know, the, the expense it takes to get the food there. So it really doesn't matter if you're shipping chicken or tofu or lobster or um, a steak, um, and so you actually get fed, fed quite a, pretty, pretty well there. Um, but also working out in the cold, you burn a lot of calories, um, and so you, you do need food. So, you know, a lot of improvements over the years, um, but a lot of things are, are just still the same. And I think uh, the, you know, the human drive to, to know more, uh, to understand uh, what's going on in the universe, you know, that's still, that's still what's driving our desire to go to places like, like the South Pole. So, thanks.